I swear to God I do. Okay. Anyway, up to this point, everything we've looked at has had a bound, meaning that when you looked at your integral, there was a value here and a value here. What we're going to do today is talk about what we call the general antiderivative. Meaning that it does not have a bound. It does not have a beginning and an end. It has simply an integral of the function f of x dx. Meaning there is no beginning and no end. So what we do is we call this a general antiderivative. So when you take a general antiderivative, if you have some lowercase function f of x that looks like this, its antiderivative becomes capital F of X plus C. So that plus C is coming into play because the C is what we call an arbitrary constant. It's making up for the account that we don't know if this original function had a constant as part of its antiderivative. So what that means is that if lowercase f of x is equal to 2x. Its antiderivative was capital F of x, where you add back 1 to your exponent and divide by that new exponent. So it means that this derivative came from x squared, but what we don't know is it could have been x squared plus 9, because the derivative of 9 is 0. So when you got your new lowercase f of x, you had 2x because this could have been 9 or it could have been 100 or it could have been negative 1. So that's where we put in this c. So if I don't have a beginning and an end point to my integral, meaning it is an indefinite integral, I don't know if there was a constant that was being added or subtracted to it. So we call capital F of X like the family of an antiderivatives, where C gives us all the family numbers that could have been part of my family, but we don't know. Huh? Yeah, like these guys. So we've already talked about this. What do we call this? I know it's not on your notes. What's this called? Yeah, this is the reverse power rule, right? So antiderivative in general still uses the reverse power rule. So we're still going to look at the reverse power rule today. You don't need to write it down. We, you should know it. Just reiterating. I did, however, because I never actually gave you them, put the uh, trig ones on them. But however, you should know them. Exactly. But... I threw them on here just as a reminder in case you would ever go back and look at your notes. All right, f of x equals x squared is representative of the derivative. So what's its antiderivative? Meaning what came before x squared? So what's capital F of x? Yes. What came before 12x squared? Yes, so the whole point is this plus c plus c plus c. If there is no bound on my integral, so again, this is kind of like saying f of x equals x to the negative 3 
So find this. That's what the directions state. So I didn't go like that. So like find this. So what is the antiderivative of this? Add one. Mm -hmm. Told you today was not going to be so good. Okay, we're going to look at some trig ones. Okay, sine x. What's the antiderivative of positive sine? Okay, antiderivative of cosine. Now this is where they get goofy because normally if you take a derivative of a cosine, it's a negative sign. So it's positive in reverse. You can do right. You, I could ask you to find the the ninety sixth derivative of yeah, sine because you just yeah. take ninety six divided by four and figure out where you are in the cycle. We did. And then we did it with sine equals sine. We did it with eyes because all the eyes do the same thing. That's what I'm teaching on Tuesday. We just hit conquer. Okay, secant x, tan x because secant x, tan x becomes oh. Just tan, or just secant rather, because the secants and the tans still aren't ever negative. It's just the cosines and the cosecants and the cotangents. And then do not forget your plus c. I And eventually, we're going to find out what C what? is. <laughs> yeah. So, what, what you what it will do is it'll probably be like, okay, capital F of pi fourths equals one. So then, like you would plug pi fourths in, get root two over two. Or whatever, and like, yeah, like you have to like plug the pi force the one in and solve for c. Like you work backwards, so like one would go here, pi force would go here. It's solve for c. All right, how about the square root of x? So what you have to do is turn it into x to the one half. Yeah. Okay, so you add one and divide by your new exponent. Yeah. Two thirds. Oh, you put your that way. I'm sorry. I was like, where are you getting two thirds? But I would have. I was I was ready to put three halves. Boom. I just punched. I just. Yeah, there was one of those on your test. Oh, and there was, I got it right. Thank you. Well, there was also a square root of x in the denominator, so just write it off as x to the negative one half, yeah, and turn it right. into the square root of x. Square root. Yes, I think that. 
Because this is x to the negative one half. Yeah, I just really didn't know what to make So then you add, and then you add one. So you get x to the one half over one half. So then you get two square roots of two square roots of x. But then, like somewhere in there, you like it was like eight square roots of two minus two. I think was like part of the answer. Like once you plug the numbers back in, you got eight square roots of two. Because this was a four, so then the square root of four was two, so two times two. Something. I don't remember exactly. I did it like three days ago. Okay. What do you mean a numerator? It mouth? was like the integral of like three x over x squared plus four. Yeah, there was a typo. I'm not creating that letter. Oh, cool. It was oh, supposed okay. to be a two x in the numerator. So then it was the natural log. I integrated the numerator and I integrated the So it's if it was, but however, see, like I was hoping you tried to L on it. I did. Because I it needed to be a two. If you pulled out the three, like it needed to be a two. Like it was supposed to be a two x over x squared, so I just put a big x on it. I realized. Okay, how do you do? How do you do this one then? Because you don't have a quotient rule. No, this is not an L. No. No. He said it. He said. So it's 2600 x to the negative 3 plus 2x to the negative 2, because you take 1 and subtract it, and then plus 0 0.001, and the x cubes cancel on the end. Now you integrate each piece of the function separately. So you add 1 to this, so you get 2600x zero, zero, to the negative 2 over negative 2, plus 2x to the negative 1 over negative 1, plus 0 0.001x. Plus, plus C. C. And then you clean it up. So what? Okay, how about the E's? So we haven't looked at an E yet, but what do you know if you work? Right, so think about lowercase f of x and capital F of x. So if this was E to the x plus C, the derivative of this would be good. So the reverse is E to the x plus C. So this is letter J. And then how about K? How would that 3 affect it? Yeah, you can kind of think of it as out in front, right? So it's still 3 e to the x dx. So you get 3 e to the x plus c. Now here's where you have to be careful. It's technically a 3c. Not that the C can't absorb it, but it's still, that's what I said, the C kind of absorbs it, but that 3 is sort of there anyway. Did you keep it like... I am aware. There will be problems where you do need it. 
because I could ask you to anti-derive the anti-derivative. And what? then, uh, <laughs> so like, we're going to eventually go backwards to integrations. So just like you could take two derivatives, you take two antiderivatives. And then you're going to have C sub 1 and C sub 2. So I won't torture your brains with the um, actual... Uh, numerical values. 